and rightly so. We often find the deepest cries of our hearts echoed in the psalmist's words. Our raw fear and confusion, doubt and grief, voiced in ways we never would have dared. The psalms meet us in these dark places and gently guide us into the light, offering truth as the salve to our wounds. Psalm 77 is no exception. It was written by a man named Asaph, whom we've already gotten to know a little bit through George's sermon on Psalm 73. If you remember, Asaph was the worship leader, the ing of the entire nation of Israel. He wrote music that was used in worship at the temple day in and day out. Thank you, that lighting is so much better. Um, Asaph was a prominent spiritual leader in Israel, but he was also human, just like you and me, and Pastor Sam and Ng. His leadership did not shield him from the hard knocks of life, and he too wrestled with doubts and struggles to find an anchor for his hope. Psalm 77 is a window into his own heart in the midst of an intense struggle. He is vulnerable in a way that we rarely are with each other. And by doing so, he gives voice to the inner turmoil that so many of us never speak about. The struggle is very real. We don't know exactly what the circumstances were behind this psalm. And even if we did, most of us probably couldn't relate to a crisis such as a military defeat or the destruction of the temple. However, I believe that all of us can or at some point will relate to the way Asaph feels. Let's begin reading together in verse 1. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God and he will hear me. I sought the Lord in my day of trouble. My hands were continually lifted up all night long. I refused to be comforted. I think of God and I groan. I meditate and my spirit becomes weak. Selah. There's no real translation for this word selah, but it basically just means pause and take a moment to reflect on that. Asaph is crying out to God day and night. He's up all night crying and praying, seeking God, seeking answers, seeking comfort, but there is no relief. He remembers God, but instead of leading him to a place of peace and rest, he's even more troubled. What has comforted him in the past is not sufficient here. His words are reduced to groans. He comes to the end of his own inner strength. We continue reading, You have kept me from closing my eyes. I am troubled and cannot speak. Asaph is both sleepless and speechless. He starts out in verse 1 by crying out, and by the end of verse 4, he is so distraught he can no longer speak. There are no more words. And what is often the only form of temporary relief in this type of anguish, sleep, is denied him. And so he lies awake, and with no more strength to petition, he begins to fixate on the way things used to be. He says, I consider days of old, years long past. We've all been there. We want to go back to the way things were before. Before our loved one died. Before our bank account was empty. Before we struggled with depression and anxiety. Before we moved to a new and unfamiliar place. We long for before. Even if in reality it wasn't so great. And when we do so, we feed our despair. Asaph is no different. He longs for the days of old, the years when everything was right with the world, but he finds no comfort dwelling 
in the past. And so he turns to his music. He says, at night I remember my music. I meditate in my heart and my spirit ponders. Asaph is the worship leader. His job is literally to write music that leads people in remembrance and worship of God. And so he starts flipping through the songbook in his head. He runs through chorus after chorus, songs about God's deliverance, his compassion and grace, his power and justice. We know this because we have just a small portion of the songs that he wrote in the Psalms. George preached on them, uh, one of them just a few weeks ago, and Asaph says, Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You think that would encourage anybody, right? (laughs) <laughs> he's thinking through these choruses, the things he's written, the things that he's sung, day after day after day. Surely he feels better now. But as Asaph meditates on these songs, something else happens. The contrast between the lyrics of the songs that he sings and the reality of his present experience is too stark to ignore. His songs proclaim God's goodness and faithfulness, his love and compassion, but in his life he just doesn't see it. And so he comes to a breaking point, a place where honesty is more important than saving face. He can no longer ignore the questions that are burning in his soul. Read with me, starting in verse 7. Will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? Is his promise at an end for all generations? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? And he comes to this conclusion. So I say, I am grieved that the right hand of the Most High has changed. Asaph is bringing the very character of God to task. He's questioning who God claims to be. You see, at the core of the Israelites' faith, at the core of his faith, was God's own declaration of his character and who he promised to be. We find this in Exodus 34. This this passage is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Okay, everyone knew it. And Asaph is referring to it specifically here. And anyone at his time who would have read it would have known exactly what he was talking about. Okay, God has just brought the Israelites through the Exodus. He's speaking with Moses and he says this. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh. Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin. Does this sound familiar at all? This is exactly what Asaph was questioning. He's saying, God, this is who you say you are, and I don't know if I believe it anymore. I don't see it. And we don't have it up there. Okay. <laughs> um, if you look at these, uh, these two passages side by side, you can see, right? The question he asks, will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? Okay, over here, we learn that God is rich in faithful love, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations forever, Right? Has God forgotten to be gracious? God says over here that he is a gracious God. Has he in anger withheld his compassion? God says over here that he's compassionate and slow to anger. The parallels are stunning. Asaph doesn't just say, 
I can't really see God at work right now. I don't know what's going on, but I trust you. No, his despair, his anguish led him to a place where he is doubting the creed of his faith. His heart cries out like so many before and so many after, has God forgotten me? Is he angry with me? Has he stopped loving me? Is he reneging on all of his promises? He says, I thought I knew who God was. I've always believed that he was who he says he was, but he's not acting according to his character in my life. Where is his compassion? Where is his love? Has he cast me aside and forgotten me? Or is he no longer powerful enough to do anything about my situation? Asaph Asaph has hit rock bottom. Engulfed in despair and defeat. Alone in unrelenting anguish. God is silent. Sleep is elusive. Pain that cuts so deep it can no longer be voiced. Words and songs that might normally bring comfort only serve to mock your suffering. I don't know where that dark place is for you, but we've all been there or will be. Maybe you've lost a parent or a spouse, a sibling or a child. Maybe your marriage is held together by a thread or your health is rapidly declining. Prayers and questions go unanswered. The embers of your hope have grown cold. You feel forgotten, overlooked, unloved, and alone. Your situation seems unredeemable. And the songs you sing here in church on Sunday morning, directly contradict everything that you are experiencing. You and I are not alone. Asaph looks at his circumstances and who God is and sees that the numbers don't add up. The dots don't connect. Is God really the same God who parted the Red Sea? who miraculously delivered Israel from Egypt, can he be trusted to act according to his faithful love? Asaph remembers God. He remembers God, but it only makes him groan thinking that God is not present in his current circumstances. He remembers how great things used to be, and his present is even more unbearable. He remembers his music, music that declares the greatness and goodness of God, and it only deepens his grief. God must have changed. But in verse 11, he turns his gaze to God, specifically to what God has done. Read with me, starting in verse 11. I will remember the Lord's works. Yes, I will remember your ancient wonders. And just like that, the psalmist transitions from talking about God to talking to God. And it makes all the difference. In verses 7 through 9, Asaph was questioning God's character. But in verse 11 and on, Asaph remembers and meditates on God's actions. His actions which demonstrate and prove his character. I could stand up here all day and tell you about how patient my husband George is, right? But if you saw him uh, yelling at kids in kids' church, cutting in line during the potluck, looking on his, scrolling through Facebook on his phone during church, you wouldn't believe me, right? (laughs) Those things are not true. George is very patient. (laughs) But if I said that, if I said George is patient, and then everything you saw that he did contradicted that statement, which would you believe? My words or his actions? His actions. Right? Because ultimately, actions are the true indicator of character. 
And so when Asaph is wondering about God's character, he has to look to God's actions. Is God really all of these things he says he is? Let's see what he, let's see what he says. Starting in verse 12. I will reflect on all you have done and meditate on all your actions. God, your way is holy. What God is great like God? He thinks about what God has done and comes to the conclusion that no one can compare. None of the other numerous pagan gods at the time could do anything. They were made of brick and stone and wood, right? But Yahweh had proved himself. He had performed wonder after wonder after wonder, and Asaph remembers and meditates on these actions. And it is this type of remembrance that begins to bring him out of his despair. He begins to talk to God directly, and God reveals himself to him. He says, you are the God who works wonders. You revealed your strength among the peoples. With power you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. Pause and think about that. You are the God who works wonders. Asaph is not just thinking abstractly here. Okay? He has a specific event in mind. Does anybody have any idea what that event is? What is he thinking about when he's thinking about what God has done? No takers. What has God done in the past to prove his character? the exodus. Okay, the descendants and Joseph were the descendants of Jacob and Joseph that he's talking about here were all of the people enslaved in Egypt. They were oppressed with no visible way to freedom. They cried out to the God of their fathers of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and God sent Moses to deliver them. Now many of us grew up learning about the exodus with flannel graphs, am I dating myself, uh, veggie tales, and coloring pages covered in frogs or baby Moses floating down the river, okay? And because of all of this, we've lost the wonder and awe of what God did. Think about it. Plague after plague pummeled the Egyptians. Locusts, boils, hail, what a horrible time to be alive as an Egyptian, until Pharaoh finally decides to let them go free. But no sooner has he decided this than he sends out his entire army after them to slaughter them and bring them back. The Israelites find themselves trapped between the Red Sea and the Sea of Pharaoh's army with no boats and no weapons. We all know the story from here. You can see in your mind Moses with his staff in the air, the path opening up for the entire nation to walk literally straight through the sea to the safety of the other side. While their pursuers perish as the sea swallows them whole. This is not just a cool story for a rainy day. It's not meant to be just taught in children's church. It is literally the salvation and birth of a nation. And it's the confirmation of everything that God claims to be. God demonstrates his power and his love, his authority and compassion. He was their only hope, and he came through. This is the defining moment in history for Israel. Everything before and everything after the Exodus is interpreted in light of this event. It is the very foundation of who they are as a people of God, saved, loved, forgiven, chosen. And to this very day, thousands of years later, Jews celebrate the Exodus every single year with a feast called the Passover. 
a feast created by God for the sole purpose of remembering and celebrating who he is and what he did for them through the exodus. God redeemed his people in a mighty way, and Asaph is beginning to find a foothold for his hope in what God has done. Let's continue reading in verse 16. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you, and they trembled. Even the depths shook. The clouds poured down water. The storm clouds thundered. Your arrows flashed back and forth. And the sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Lightning lit up the world. The earth shook and quaked. Your way went through the sea and your path through the great waters. But your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. This passage is meant to leave us awestruck. God is the embodiment of strength and power. He controls the entire cosmos, and yet he chooses to use that power to act on behalf of his people. Asaph anchors himself in the Exodus, God, this is what you did, and it proves who you are. God, you redeemed Israel out of an impossible situation, and you will act according to your character. You will redeem again. But after describing such a glorious display of God's power and greatness, he makes a stunning statement. Your way went through the sea and your path through the great waters, Clearly the exodus, right? But your footprints were unseen. Even in the greatest event of, in all of Israel's history, God was not physically present. He did not make footprints in the sand on the bottom of the Red Sea. He worked instead through the guiding hand of Moses and Aaron. Isn't it amazing how often we can only see God's hand in hindsight? Isn't it amazing how often we can only see God's hand in hindsight? Even in the midst of the entire Exodus event, the people didn't necessarily understand everything that was happening the way that we do looking back. I'm sure when they were trapped between the sea and the army, they were wondering, where is God? Did he lead us out here just to let us be slaughtered? But they followed the guiding hand of Moses and Aaron. And Asaph realizes that just because he can't see God right now doesn't mean he's not there. On the contrary, God is his shepherd. He will not leave Asaph alone without a guide. Now, the psalm seems to end somewhat abruptly here, but appropriately. Nothing about Asaph's circumstances have changed, but his remembrance of God's actions leads him to trust that God would continue to act according to his character, even when he couldn't see it. God would find another way through the sea. What is your sea? Where do you need redemption, hope, deliverance? When we find ourselves in the darkest night of our souls, how do we find hope and comfort? When God's character is put on trial in our hearts, where can we turn? Sometimes just saying, God is good, God is loving, God is gracious and compassionate is not enough. We must remember specifically what he has done 
to prove that he is good and loving and gracious and compassionate. We have to remember for ourselves and continually tell each other, God, faithful love will never end, and here's why. You may not see it, but it's true, and here's the evidence. What is that evidence? In Asaph's world, the strongest case for God's character was found in the Exodus. But we have the privilege of living thousands of years later. Is the Exodus the only time that God has shown up to redeem his people? Seriously, that's a question. Vicki says no. <laughs> and she's right, no. <laughs> okay, we have a second Exodus to remember. Many years after Asaph lived and died, God, in complete fulfillment of his character, became a man and lived and died that we might be free. I'm talking, of course, about Jesus. There are many parallels between the journey of the nation of Israel and the life of Jesus that, unfortunately, I don't have time to elaborate on. But I think it's very important to realize that Jesus saw his own death and resurrection as a second exodus. In Luke chapter 9, just several weeks before his crucifixion, Jesus takes a handful of disciples up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, okay, this is uh, Luke chapter 9, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men were talking with him. Moses, the one who led the first exodus, and Elijah. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his death. This word death in Greek is literally exodon. Okay, it should be translated exodus. They were speaking of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. When Jesus died and rose again, the sky grew dark. The earth quaked, the curtain tore in two, and sin and death was defeated once and for all. It is at the cross that Jesus demonstrates God's mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and steadfast love to their fullest capacity through his redemption of all mankind. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the defining moment in our history. Israel was born as a mighty nation in the first exodus. And through the second exodus, the church, which would eventually include people of every tribe and tongue and nation, was born. It is this act of redemption, this exodus, that anchors our hope in the present and for the future. But in the same way that the Israelites had to go through the wilderness before entering the promised land, we too are in the wilderness. And the wilderness is hard. We don't always see God in the wilderness. We're thirsty and tired, hungry and hot, and we begin to doubt God's love and care for us. We're angry at him for bringing us out here, and we feel as if we can't go on. We haven't seen his footprints for miles. Has he abandoned us? The struggle is very real. And it's a struggle that Jesus anticipates. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. He was remembering the first exodus. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance 
of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus knew we would need to remember. He knew we would question his character, his love, his mercy. He knew we would struggle to feel him and see him. And so he exhorts us to remember. And in communion, we remember the redemptive acts of God in community. Together as a church, we declare that God is who he says he is. That the God who delivered the Israelites from Egypt is the same God who came to earth and died on the cross and rose again to deliver us from sin. And that God, that gracious, compassionate, merciful, faithful, forever loving God is the same God that we worship and serve today here together in this room as his church. He has given us his spirit and his word and each other to guide us through the wilderness and into the eternal promised land. Here at Loft, we take communion together every week. Inga's is going to play a song, and when you're ready, you can come forward and retrieve the elements, and George will come up and lead us in taking it together. When we take communion, Jesus tells us to do this in remembrance. Remember the exodus. Remember his death and resurrection. Remember who God is, the God who redeems, who brings light out of darkness, life out of death, who sets the slaves free, who turns tears into laughter. Remember and hope. His final exodus is coming. God is compassionate and loving, slow to anger, and abounding in love and mercy. He has not forgotten, and he will not let us down. <laughs>